just thank you for them lord we love our youth thank you for them and i pray today as they go to their groups that you would teach them god that in due season they would just love jesus and follow him all the days of their lives in jesus name amen good i like that hallelujah you've been well trained frankie that's good Okay, if you want to turn in your Bibles to the, the Gospel of John. I'm just going to look at some teaching that Jesus brought to the disciples. So it's John chapter 4. It's going to be towards the end in verses 31 to 38. Okay. I'm sure that child crying is all right, being taken off forcefully to crash or whatever. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be all right. We are, we're a good church. We love our kids. Okay, John chapter 4, verses 31 to 38. And I suppose I'm calling this message the, the white fields the white fields. If you are a note taker, I know there might be some in the, in the room, but the white fields. And so let's read the word of the Lord from verse 31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And so in the context, the disciples have left Jesus by the well where he meets a, a woman that he converses with and shares about the kingdom of God and she comes to salvation. And the disciples return, having got that food, and then Jesus is talking about, I've already got food, and they're going, what's he on about? And so you see that in the Gospels a lot, the, the disciples catching up with what Jesus is really trying to say to them. And then Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. So that, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. And it's interesting how Jesus kind of talks about the work that he's doing. He says it's, it's food for him. And looking around, I'm sure we all like food, so, some more than others. 
some healthy eating, some like unhealthy eating, and I'm a bit of a balance. Sometimes I, I've got a real sweet tooth. Any other sweet toothers? Dave is. Me and Dave, first for the biscuits all the time. And so we all like food because food gives us a sense of comfort, which is not a bad thing unless it goes too far. Food gives us energy for life. We need food. It's pleasurable. It's even relational when we eat with others and we, we converse over meals. So, so food for humanity is really, really important. But Jesus kind of says, actually, all that pales in insignificance compared to the true food that he has been eating. And they're like, what's he on about this, this true food? Has he, has he been having a, having a secret scoff somewhere whilst we've been looking for food? But Jesus's food, his sustenance, his enjoyment, his, his source of life is to be obedient to his heavenly father. That Jesus's will was to do the Father's will, and that gave him life. He, he wasn't so bothered about enjoying the fruits of life, as it were, but he enjoyed doing what the Father did. And, and Jesus liked life, didn't he? We know that Jesus was accused of being a, a drunkard and a glutton, that he ate too much and he drunk, drank too much, but Jesus enjoyed life. And as Christians, we're meant to enjoy life. Wine is good for the soul in moderation. Food is good for us to enjoy and enjoy what God has, has given us in moderation but the father's will should be our first priority like jesus and there's something about doing the father's will in the life of jesus that we are also called to do and if you think about what jesus is doing he's going around telling people about his heavenly father he's calling people to repentance which means kind of turning away from the way they've been living to live for god to go God's way and not theirs and to kind of begin that journey of, of discovering the, the love of God and what that means. And that is what Jesus is pushing his disciples to do. And as they go on that journey, there's something of growth and discovery that happens as they go about the Father's business. And yesterday we were out in the town um, sharing the good news of Jesus, seeing if we could pray for people and... I think everyone on the team that went out that I talked to really felt a sense of life. It's like, we're meant to be doing this. This is food for the soul. It's, we're nervous. We're getting a lot of no's. But we're here to represent Jesus who loves us, who's rescued us, who saves us and, and invites everyone into, into um, his salvation, into his kingdom. And there's an element where witness brings about a growing sense of sanctification. And that word sanctification, it's a, it's, a, it's a big word, but all it means is becoming more like Jesus. Sanctify means holy to be set apart. So how more and more of our life is becoming more like Jesus? Because I want to be more like Jesus because he's the, the greatest person that ever lived. He was God, he was man, but he showed something of what it means to live in right relationship with God that we can love others like he loved us, that we can lay our lives down for others so others can succeed and it's not all about us. And when you are going out witnessing, we really do pray and we really do get in the word because we want to be prepared. And I think a lot of people maybe yesterday before they came out prayed a lot more than they had done in a while because you want to be ready. And so there's that element where if we're going to be witnesses, we need to feed ourselves with the word of God. We need to pray and it enables us to grow and I think without the witness, we can really decline in our faith. We can kind of wither. The passion and excitement of our faith gets really quite stagnant because we're not doing what the Father has called us to do. And in verse 34, Jesus says, um, hang on, it's not that passage. If you want to turn to Matthew 9, sorry, Matthew 9, which is kind of a similar story that Jesus talk so in Matthew 9 verses 37 to 38 Jesus says this ask the har uh, then he said to his disciples the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few ask the Lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into his harvest field and so we're going to unpack that a little bit more in, in a moment. But there's just that element where Jesus is, is pushing his disciples 
to seek the answer to the problem. So the problem is that there's a harvest and it's not a natural harvest. It's kind of like a, a spiritual harvest of salvation, but there's not enough workers. There's all these people that God has been working in their life to try and reveal himself. He's trying to reveal his love to them, yet there's no one to tell them about himself. And we know that God can appear to people. We hear stories of that throughout, throughout history where people have had dreams about Jesus and they've come to faith. Or where missionaries have gone into the jungle and have met with a, um, with a tribe that have been so disconnected from the rest of the world, yet they know about Jesus. They might not know his name, but they know what he's done on the cross. And they talk about the, the wounds in his wrists and the hole in his side and the fact that he's, he's loving and he's forgiving. So God is stepping into people's lives, but the main way he does that is to call workers into the, into the harvest field to go out and do the stuff. But in, the, um, in verse 35, Jesus says, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. And in, in, the, in the Greek of which the, the gospel is written, the literal translation is actually lift up your eyes. It's not open your eyes, it's lift up your eyes. And when we are downcast or we're very kind of self-focused, we're very much looking at ourselves, aren't we? And it's about our life, about how we're feeling or about our circumstances, which is all important. We can't escape ourselves. The old saying, wherever we go, there we are. We can't escape ourselves. But if we are so self-focused on ourselves, we miss the opportunities that God has got for us and around us. So it's not open your eyes, it's lift up your eyes. They're not ignoring the harvest, they're just not seeing it because it's so self-focused. And there's a danger that as, as a church here at Lighthouse, that we can become so self-focused and so inward-focused we miss the mission field for which Jesus has commissioned us to go out into. That we're not a church simply to gather and have a great time. We're not simply a church that gathers to sing songs on a Sunday and then come back next Sunday. That actually we gather as the church to be built up, to love God, to be taught, to be inspired, to be challenged, to then go out into our everyday lives and be those witnesses for why God has saved us and kept us on this earth. If God didn't want us to be witnesses and he'd had enough of us in terms of being on this earth, he'd take us to be in heaven with him. But we're here to love God and to make him known. Jesus said that, that the, the, the whole law was wrapped up in, in loving God and loving our neighbours, we love ourselves. But sometimes we, start, we miss the middle bit out. We love God and we love ourselves. That's the human condition. That's the natural selfishness of the human heart to draw ourselves into ourselves and make us more and more isolated, more and more self-focused. Yeah, we experience God. We know God loves us. He's rescued us. We're going to heaven. But what about the lost? Those in our families or our friends or our work colleagues who might not even know we're Christians because we're scared of rejection. But we've got this amazing treasure in jars of clay, the great treasure of Jesus and the great news of the gospel. And so as a church, we want to be inwardly strong in terms of we want to love each other well, we want to glorify God, we want to equip and train each other up for works of service, which means loving each other but also loving the world. But we want to be outwardly focused. That actually we're, we're looking at what are the needs of our town, who needs to hear the good news, where do we meet need in our town in the name of Jesus? Because we don't just give a handout without saying it's in the name of Jesus. Because otherwise we're just like other kind, generous, loving people in the world. We give out good stuff, we meet need, but we're doing it in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says to the disciples that the, the harvest is ripe. It's ready. That the, the, It's white in the sense that the, the, the flowers are on top saying it's come to maturity. It's now time to go out into the harvest and to, and to reap what we haven't sown. And the thing about um, harvest is that the, it's the, the farmers or the workers don't make it grow. They might provide the right conditions, they'll sow the seed, but they don't magically 
do chants over the seeds. They don't go home and I'm going to pray for those seeds. I've planted that they're going to grow. I hope they don't. Um, or they don't think, actually, those, I think those flowers are going to like this music. I'm going to play this music for them, like some, peop some people, I think, have tried to do in the past. I don't know if Prince Charles or King Charles now was one of those where he used to like to play music to his plants because it benefited them. They don't do anything to make it grow. God makes it grow. God is the one who grows the harvest, whether that's a natural harvest or a spiritual. As Christians, we're called to sow the seeds. We tell the good news and they, they land in people's hearts, as it were, and they either bear fruit immediately or in the future or not at all. But we're called to sow the seeds. And sometimes we actually get to reap where someone else has been sowing before, that we might be the 10th person that tells somebody about Jesus and it's enough to bring a fruitfulness to that, that seed that's been sown over the years and has been watered by countless other people who've said, Jesus loves you. And he died for you and he wants to rescue you from, from sin, shame and separation. And the Bible tells us that the Father and Jesus are always working elsewhere. Jesus says, you know, my Father's always been working. He's always doing stuff. And what's he working, doing? Because we know in Genesis it says on the seventh day God rested. But we know that's kind of symbolic. He's never really stopped working because he's always saving people. He's, al he's always looking to pull people out of darkness into light out of separation and into relationship. And so the Father's working, he's working in our town. Do we see it? Do we believe it? Do we believe that actually he answers our prayers and that he's partnering with his church in this town to see people come to faith? But I've never yet seen another church out on the streets. And that's not to say that we're any better because we only did it first time yesterday, really. We've been two in our building. But where are the other Christians to go out and share the good news of the gospel? And we want to kind of pioneer that as, as a church in this town afresh. We're going to be getting out there once a month to share the good news of Jesus. The Bible tells us that one man sows, another waters, but God makes it all grow. And sometimes God is, is there, look, the harvest is right, but where are my workers? Where are my workers? And in the context of, of, the, um, of the passage in, in John 4, like I said before, he's, Jesus has stayed at the well to meet a lady who he talks to and she comes to faith. And she goes then into the town to tell others about Jesus. She goes to them and says, come and learn about the man or come and meet the man who's told me everything about myself, that he knows all about me. He's, he's the... He's the Messiah, and he's the one that is, is going to rescue the nation and the world. But it's interesting that these um, Samaritans come out of the village, and, and they come to meet Jesus, and, and they say later on in, in chapter 4, um, and it is verse 42. So they, the, the crowd that have come out from the, from the village or the town, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. That her testimony made people hungry and thirsty to know about Jesus. And they meet them, meet Jesus themselves and they come to faith. And we've, most of us here who are Christians have come to faith because someone's told us about Jesus. Nobody had a dream necessarily cold about Jesus. It was maybe on the back of somebody sharing about the gospel. Maybe it was the 10th person, 20th person, 50th person that told you about Jesus. And you finally said, yeah, actually, I believe that the Father op has opened your eyes and your heart to the truth that Jesus died, that he was buried and he rose again on the third day. And in Matthew 9 that I read before that Jesus says, you know, send workers out into, into the vineyard. Jesus calls himself kind of like the, the Lord of the harvest, or he calls the Father the Lord of the harvest. Because it's God's work, as I said before, that is making it grow. So if you turn back into Matthew 9, verses 37 to 38, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. 
and basically telling the disciples to pray, pray for others to come and join you. But if you read on to chapter 10, the answer to their prayers and the need are the disciples themselves. And so if you've been praying for the lost, Lord, raise up people to go and share. God says to you today, why are you not going out and sharing? It's not enough just to pray. God doesn't want you just to pray for workers. He wants you then to become a worker and out into the harvest. It's easy to pray. It's not easy to be a witness. It's easy to be in our room praying. It's not easy to be sharing our faith with our work colleagues or our neighbours. And I think today Jesus is knocking on some people saying, look, yeah, pray. You've got to pray. You've got to cover it in prayer. But why are you not sharing? Why are you not working? Because I've called each believer to be a worker in the vineyard or into the field. And I find evangelism really, I find it difficult. I'm not a natural evangelist, but I know it's important, so I'll do it. And when I first became a Christian, I remember telling my mates and my brother that I'd become a, a Christian. And I was really excited to tell them. I thought they'd be really excited too. No, they weren't. They kind of laughed at me and mocked me and said, my brother said, it's because you smoke too much pot. My mate said, it's, it's only because you, you um, Nicholas, Nicola and her family are Christians. And so you're just being a Christian for her. So she doesn't dump you like a, like a previous girlfriend had because she was a Christian and I wasn't. She dumped me. Look at me now. I know we're joking. <laughs> and so telling them they laughed and my brother said, keep talking about Jesus and I'll hit you. And so I told him about Jesus and he was true to his word and it hit me. And it really affected me and, and kind of like my family didn't really understand it. And they kind of said, oh, you're only doing it because of Nicola. And so I had a real kind of bit of a kick in the guts, not from my brother, but kind of symbolically of sharing faith. And so for Many years I was kind of quiet. I didn't even tell people at, at, when I was a teacher at school. I kind of just didn't want to have that rejection. So I let fear kind of override that passion and that desire and that need to tell people about Jesus. And then um, I became a pastor and I became a pastor without being a great evangelist or even great at telling people about Jesus. And so what I did when I was in Birmingham, I took a bunch of younger adults to Marseille to do mission it was really challenging going to the south of France in August <laughs> to go and tell people about Jesus. Um, out of all the places you can go, south of France is pretty good, to be honest. So we took him to, in it, uh, Marseille is lovely. And so we went to, to Marseille, but I was well out of my comfort zone. And there was a time where I was sharing about Jesus with, with, a, with a, a Muslim lady. And um, she kind of was was quite friendly and we were chatting and I just, I just prayed in my head holy spirit will you come and just reveal yourself to her because it's not us we don't do the saving it's the holy spirit and so it's the holy spirit come and open her heart to the true jesus that jesus that isn't just a prophet that jesus is is fully god and as soon as i prayed that her eyes changed they went like like inky black it was really weird and she started crying. she looked at me and she went what are you doing and I tell you what, there's nothing like that sort of thing to get you. Oh, my heart was beating. And I looked around for anyone to help and they'd all gone. So I sat and, and I was like really, really scared. But God was with me. And I, and I started to tell her more about Jesus. And then she started to cry because God is at work. She didn't give her life to Jesus in that moment, but I sowed a seed. And I could have stepped back out of fear again, thinking what, what's kind of in her <laughs> that's looking out at me now. But I was scared. But Jesus is always faithful. If we're witnessing, we will get rejected. But they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting Jesus. And so I was saying that to the team yesterday. So it's not, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus. So let's let it wash off. And that gives you a bit of boldness to go out and tell people about Jesus, that actually we've got a great message about a great person. And we're not trying to impress people with ourselves. We want to tell them about the one who has sent us. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He was really clear about that in his message. He came to preach the good news and he raised 12 to continue that mission after he was gone. And my question is, why have we ever stopped? Why has the church ever stopped being a witness for Jesus? 
somewhere along the line, and you can debate it throughout kind of historical events that the church got really comfortable. The church kind of became mainstream and thought that was evangelism, that people went to church or they got into trouble or they got fined, that you can, let's make people go to church by punishing them. That was never the way of Jesus. Jesus was always about invitation. And somewhere along the lane, along the, the lane our faith became a private, personal faith. I've got my Jesus. You know, as long as, you know, no one's harming each other, just let, live and let live. And the Christians have used that mantra, oh, just live and let live. When actually, because you don't read your Bible, you don't realize the importance of telling people about Jesus. It's not about live and let live. It's about showing people the, the love of Jesus. We don't tell people how to live. That's not our job as the church to judge others. It's to invite them into that love relationship with Jesus. That's what witness is. And sometimes we've got it wrong in the past. Sometimes we've, we've gone to certain events and, and with placards as, as the church and just got it really wrong and been seen as people of hate rather than people of love, mercy and grace. Because that's what Jesus is like. One day he's going to judge everybody, but at the moment it's the year of the Lord's favour and we want to tell people about the love of God, the grace of God and the mercy of God. And I met a, a woman yesterday who was from one of the other high churches and she seemed a bit off that we were out evangelising. Just, I was chatting to her and she said, oh, what, what church are you from? I said, Lighthouse. I said, oh, I go, go there and kind of just kind of went off. And I got a kind of sense that we were kind of maybe offending her middle-class Christianity. Yeah, let's not rub it in people's faces, which we're not doing, but we, unless we speak, who's going to hear? How's anyone going to come to faith if they don't hear about Jesus? And that's our job to do that. And so we want to kind of kiss middle-class Christianity goodbye, where it's safe. No, we don't. We want to kick it goodbye. I'll send my brother in. He'll get rid of it. You know, we don't want that middle-class Christianity where it's about our comfort because we're doing that again. And Jesus says, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Charles Spurgeon, some of you might have heard of him. He was a, a great preacher in the Victorian times with a massive church in, in London. And there's a story of somebody from um, a newspaper visiting his church in the afternoon and visiting another in the morning. And the, the morning one was um, this great communicator who apparently had built a statue of himself outside his church. And he went to see him in the morning, went to see Spurgeon in the evening. And when somebody asked him, how did you find both? He said, well, in the morning, I thought, what a great communicator, really, really gifted. But in the evening, I thought, what a great Jesus. That actually, it's about us projecting Jesus and pointing people to Jesus. It's not about a charismatic leader at the front who's going to be all singing, all dancing. It's actually, how do we reveal Jesus? in our frailty and in our brokenness. I've still got sin issues in my life. I still make mistakes. Still, sometimes I wonder, why am I a pastor? But it's Jesus. Jesus' is grace and mercy. And Spurgeon said this, he said, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself, be sure of that. It's been a harsh word, but true. If we don't have a heart for the loss, there's something going wrong in us. It's about us, we've, we've made it selfish. The Holy Spirit in us is meant to be a, a missional spirit that sends us out into the world. And we can make the Holy Spirit all about us having nice experiences. All of us having, oh yeah, God spoke to me. But actually the main way the Spirit of God is in you is to send you out and to be a witness. That's, and Jesus said, the, the Spirit will fill you and remind you of everything that I've taught. That's the main witness of the Spirit. It's not to have um, experiences, not even to get more free. It's to be a witness. And as part of that, there is sanctification, there is healing and wholeness. And the Spirit wants to move us out into the world. And, and the UK now is post-Christian. We're in unfamiliar, unfamiliar territory. We are kind of outsiders again. You see that on social media. You see that on the news. Any sort of kind of Christian is, is, is slated and seen as bigoted. And we've got to be careful we don't come across as bigoted. But we are seen as being outsiders. 
And Formby is a hard place. Like I've, I don't live in Formby, I live in Southport and I've ministered in other, other, other towns and done mission in other places. Formby's hard because there's a self-sufficiency. There's that Formby face, that Formby facade that people put on that, you know, everything's all right. But we know that everyone needs a saviour. And that even we as Christians, we need to die for our saviour daily. We need Jesus' death daily, multiple times to keep rescuing us. Matthew 5, 13 to 16, Jesus basically tells the disciples that you are salt and that you are light. And the thing is, they're already that. They don't have perfect lives, but they're already salt to the world. They're already light for the world because they've got, got Jesus in them and with them. And so as Christians, we don't wait to be perfect to be a witness because we'll never witness. Well, we mess it up. But the thing about salt is it makes you thirsty. And the thing about light is it reveals. And so let your light make shine before others, Jesus said, but also let your lives be thirsty. Just tell them about Jesus. In all your frailty, in all your brokenness, you've got a saviour who loves you anyway. This is a quote from, um, let's have a look. I wrote this on my phone last night, so it's not in front of me very easily. By John Piper who's a, um, a pastor in America, he said, radical obedience to Christ is not easy. It's not comfort, it's not health, it's not wealth, and not prosperity in this world. Radical obedience, sorry, this is David Platt, radical obedience to Christ risks losing all these things. But in the end, such risk finds its reward in Christ, and he is more than enough for us. And so if Christ is everything, will you step up for him? Will you take a risk of being laughed at, rejected, mocked for sharing your faith? Because Jesus was spat at when he went to the cross. He was mocked with a crown of thorns that dug in his head and made him bleed. He was mocked by having a purple robe put on him as though he was some sort of royalty to the, uh, to the Romans. He was, he was mocked by, a, by one of the thieves on the cross, to, I think to his right. Mocked by a dying man because Jesus was also dying. Jesus knows what it's like to be mocked. But the thing is, heaven is real and so is hell. Whatever hell is going to be, we don't know. It's separation from God. And people need to know the good news of Jesus before it's too late. We need a heart for the lost. And if you haven't got one, get praying, get reading the word, letting God put on you a burden for your neighbours, for your friends, for your work colleagues. Because the power of the gospel is all sufficient for salvation. It's simple, the simple gospel. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us are sinners saved by grace in this room, if you're a Christian. But all of us have natures that rebel against God, that we want to push against the goodness and the perfection of God and go our own way. That's what sin is. It's going our own way, doing what we want as opposed to being in relationship with God. But Jesus died and took all our sin and our shame away through his death and through the power of his sacrificial blood that we would know God and be restored to him. That all the sin that we've ever done I've done today and will ever do is forgiven through the cross. That Jesus loves us as we are, not as we ought to be. He's not waiting for us to sort our sin out before he saves us, but he saves us in our sin. And he walks with us in our sin to change us and show us his love. And it's not his anger or his wrath that changes us, it's his love. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And as Christians, we can love our heavenly father because he first loved us. And if you're a mess today, if you're still in sin, God loves you. And he wants to restore you and redeem you and shape you and lead you into the fullness of life. He doesn't drop you when you sin. He says, where are you? Come back. Come and turn back to me. And this is John Piper. He says, have you ever wondered what it feels like to have a love for the lost? This is a term we use as part of our Christian jargon. 
Many believers search their hearts in condemnation, looking for the arrival of some feeling of benevolence that will propel them into bold evangelism. It will never happen for most people. It is impossible to love the lost. You can't feel deeply for an abstraction or a concept. You would find it impossible to love deeply an unfamiliar individual portrayed in a photograph, let alone a nation or a race or something as vague as all lost people. Don't wait for a feeling or love in order to share Christ with a stranger. You already love your heavenly father and you know that this stranger is created by him, but separated from him. So take those first steps in evangelism because you love God. It is not primarily out of compassion for humanity that we share our faith or pray for the lost. It's first of all, love for God. So if you love God, you'll be obedient. That's what Jesus says. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And part of that is to witness. And so don't wait for a feeling. Don't wait. Yesterday, I don't think a lot of us had a burden or real burning. I've got to share Jesus. Some people do because they've got that calling. We do it because we're, now we're, going to be, we're going to be faithful to Jesus. And people need to know about Jesus. And in Matthew 9, that when Jesus says, pray for workers to be sent out into the harvest fields. In the Greek, the literal translation is to be thrust out to kind of be pushed out, go on, you're going to do it. And so it's mainly people, workers that don't necessarily want to do it, but they're going to be pushed out by the spirit or by others. And so yesterday, there's a few times where some work were prompt, no, go on, you walk that way, go and share. You have to keep pushing others like, because fear begins to take hold and fear makes us inward looking and makes us want to protect ourselves. It's like, no, go on, you, you go back that way. Or go and share with that couple over there that come in. <laughs> okay, and do it. The Lord will thrust us out into the field. And so tomorrow when you're at work, feel that little prompting and respond. Don't keep ignoring the spirit. If someone asks you, what, how was your weekend? It's a great opportunity to say, oh, it was great. We had a great time on, at church on Sunday. And don't think because you've not been a great example at work that you can't no longer share about Jesus. If your language is being a bit bad or you got drunk in a night out, get about that. Don't do it again. But don't let that put you off sharing. Say, actually, I had a great time at church. I didn't know you went to church. I didn't know you were a Christian, which can really hurt us when they say that, can't it? I didn't know you were a Christian. Why? Can you not tell by my, the way I live my life amazingly? Can you not tell by the spirit of God in me? Can it tell me by my eyes? No, we, we hide it a lot of the time. But that's just say, yeah, I'm broken. I'm a mess, but I'm a sinner saved by grace. God loves me. And he loves you. So don't let your imperfection keep you quiet. The gospel is simple. Without Jesus, we're separated from God. Through Jesus, we're invited into relationship and we're restored. And we get the promise of eternal life. In the, in the Bible, it says that those who have Jesus have life. Those that don't, don't. It's as simple as that. And none of us earned our salvation. It's entirely by grace. And we don't keep our salvation because it's all by grace. God loves us. As long as we're abiding in Christ and we love and trust him, we're, in, we're saved. In our sins, we're saved. Whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Thank goodness. Because I'm not even perfect now, as most of you know, as your pastor. As Nicola definitely knows. Don't say a word. No. <laughs> As my kids know, as I know, we are imperfect. And I just want to get a few people just to come and share about yesterday. If anyone's interested, just come on, Sandra. Let's just welcome Sandra up. Sandra's a bit of a natural. It's the lad. So, Sandra, just very, very briefly. How briefly. did you go yesterday? Me, briefly. Yeah, that's why I'm saying it. <laughs> oh, relatively briefly. Yeah, if okay. I go like that, it's to kind of say, hurry up. All right, then. It's all right. No, we... Wonderful. We came here for the prayers first. Two, you might have to say all right. We, were <laughs> we came here for the prayers first and we were uplifted. We went out into the streets and we took our giant step forward and we met some really lovely people. A lot of lovely people that needed help. A lot of people that 
they said no, but you know, as they were walking away, I felt that the seed had landed on them. So we're waiting for that to come. We're waiting for that to come true for the Lord and everything. And I went out first with Michael. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Each one I said, can I please say a prayer for you? Can, can, can we do something so that the Lord knows, you know, that we can help? What can we do? We met, um, was it you with the man with his wife with cancer? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Come forward. Come forward, dear. <laughs> this, this young man got himself a little bit worked up to start off with. But mm. once, what, what happened once you jumped out there? They were just coming to me, the people, coming in my path. Yeah. yeah. So? Um, so I went out for the first time yesterday, and it was quite scary. Um, never done it before. I wanted to do it for quite a while. Um, Oops, you know, I, sp I, sp <laughs> I speak too loud. Um, so we started off in, obviously, the town centre, um, and I was a bit apprehensive, wasn't I? I kept going, over to, what do I say? What do I do? I don't know what how to approach. And then after about 10 minutes of rejection, the rejection felt all right, by the way. It wasn't, wasn't an issue. I remember saying to you, it feels all right, this, doesn't it? Because <laughs> um, Mark said they weren't re not rejecting you, they're rejecting the Lord, um, which I understood. But after about 10 minutes, I went over the road and I said to the Lord, um, I'm, I'm trying to pull something out here that I've naturally got. Um, just calm, calm me down. Uh, shut my mind off and open my heart, and the people will see it in my eyes. They'll see, they'll see the truth and the light. Um, so after about five minutes, people started gravitating towards me, and the Lord was telling me where to go and where to step, and and it was just coming together. Um, and I just knew what to pray, um, and I worried about scripture. I was like, Mark, I don't know scripture. He's like, Don't worry about that. Um, and it, yeah. um, and I was like, the prayer just came naturally, and I thought. If anything, today I'm going to heal one person, um, and I think we did. I think we healed a few. More than one. Yeah, hundred percent. Did more than one, mm. and that's what we felt. The reason why we did more than one is we didn't forget our sparkle. We let our light shine, and the Lord helps us f go forward with that. Thank you. Let's just thank these two. Yeah, just quick testimony. Just quick. Yeah. All of you have been praying for me, or quite a lot of you have been praying for me because of my health issues with my body and pain that I've been going through. But can I just say, look at this body. It's doing all right, and it's feeling pretty good. So thank you all for your prayers, and Lord, thank you for being there for me. Sandra, well done. And a, and a few... Weeks ago, J James got a kind of prophetic word. Somebody felt to encourage him with what they felt God was saying about him. They were saying evangelists, weren't they? Like na a natural, and I've seen that in you, and that, that was coming to the fore yesterday, but you've got to step out, be thrust out. So well done, James, and you grew in confidence. I've got to say as well, Dave's a real natural. Did great every time I've been out on the street with Dave. Just so good at talking to people, and, and he have some amazing conversations. So Dave, you're a natural evangelist so keep it up and well done it's really great seeing you just almost like an, in your natural element it's like seeing a seeing a leopard in its natural habitat it's like <laughs> it's good well done martina do you want to come and share briefly <laughs> and then i think that'll be it we'll just pray to close and then have some worship have to do it again next week. Um, I had a different experience. Well, the Lord led me to three people, and they were Christians, but they were all Orthodox Christians, and it was quite interesting. This will interest you. Two of them were Romanian, and it was lovely. And there was, can, can I just say, so the first lady, she was Romanian. She grew up in Spain, um, and she didn't speak English, only a little bit of English, but through the Spirit, we communicated, and I was able, the only thing I could say is like, Santos, she goes, oh, Jesus. Like that. So we ended up, I ended up praying for her, and then she asked me, can I pray for a brother who's got skin cancer? 
So we prayed in spirit to spirit with a little bit of words. Everything I said in English, she repeated. And then we prayed for her brother for skin cancer. And that made her just feel loved and she wasn't on her own. Then um, we were walking down the road and the Lord led me to this elderly couple. And um, I could see that he was in pain. And then walked up to him and said, excuse me, could I pray for you? And it turned out, um, Campbell, his name, um, had got lung cancer. So I was able to pray for him. And Adam came behind him and held him. Um, and his wife got her to agree because she's a Christian. So I got to agree and able to pray in an agreement. And he just said, I need all the help I can get, um, which was very, very beautiful. And then later on, um, there was a young man sitting on a bench. And I went and sat next to him. And I didn't know what to say to him. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to strack up a conversation and wait on you. So we had a conversation from Romania. <laughs> working in um, Birmingham. So he's been living in Birmingham for nine years and he came up to Formby for one day to go to our beautiful beach here in Formby. So I ended up having a conversation and asked him whether he knew Jesus. He said, yes, he knew Jesus. So I asked him, do you believe in Jesus? And he said, yes. He says, I don't pray all the time and I don't always go to church, but I do believe in Jesus. And he was telling me about his family. His mom's still in Romania. He's got some family in Birmingham. He's working. And I asked um, what you were when you had a chat with him and then asked him, is there anything I can pray for for you? And he said, yeah, well, for my well-being for work. Um, and then while I was praying, I felt the Lord say, tell him not to worry about his mother, that not to carry the burden of his mother because she's still in Romania, that she's been very, very well taken care of. Um, and he's not to feel burdened that he is here and she's in Romania. Um, so he received that and you could see that. So we prayed for finances, prayed for availability for him to be able to go more often backwards and forward to see his mother. And then also I felt led then to say to him, um, the next time when you are in church and you look at that cross and you see Jesus on it, no, he's not on it anymore. He's in heaven. And he's sitting in heaven next to Father and he loves you so much and he wants to have this relationship closer and closer. He says he wants to be your best friend all the time because he knew Jesus. So I was actually just reaffirming something that he probably knew. And it was very, very beautiful, you know, and he, and he received it and he was very grateful. So, brilliant. Thanks, Martina. So if the worship band can, can please come up. And so... You know, it's, it's great just getting out there and, and being a, a witness for Jesus. And we want to be a church that loves our town and loves each other. And so we want to be inwardly strong, as it were, but outwardly, outwardly focused. And we've got a good church for people to come to, to, to be loved, to be welcomed. We've got kids work, we've got a lot going on. But we need people to know about us. But also the priority is that they know about Jesus and are saved and, and go somewhere go to church somewhere you know we're not out there as a church growth strategy we're out there because we want to be obedient to what Jesus has called us to do and so we're going to go out again next month and if you've not been out with us and you want to come out again just let me know and we'll let you know the dates and then if you've been out this week and you want to go out again just come out I want to see maybe a team build up so people can do it we're going to do it monthly you can go out when you want yeah go out every day <laughs> We'll get, you can take the flyers out every day, whatever you want. But in terms of kind of organisationally, we're going to do it once a month. Yeah, yeah. So monthly, and then we've got Christmas coming up. Great opportunity to share about Jesus and do some nice Christmassy stuff on the streets. And yeah, so thank you for those who came out. I know some people watched come out and couldn't, but there's going to be opportunities in the future. And there's no reason why you can't go around for and, be, and just say, Lord, lead me to people and just say, Lord, can I pray for you? I want to just tell you about Jesus. If that's in your heart, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Nicola, leading the worship. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Because I, I was out in front of Nicola, and then me and Rose, we went round uh, for a little walk round to where Marks and Spencer's is. And when we turned the car, I said to you, didn't I, Rose? I said, oh, I feel really nervous now. I haven't felt nervous all morning because of the worship, but I felt vulnerable and exposed. So well done on those who would know any of the music and went out and did it because I, I started to bottle it a little bit. I felt a bit nervous. Um, but there was something definitely, Dave, about the worship, changing the atmosphere. We're, we're worshipping Jesus and where he's worshipped is close. And so there's a sense of the closeness of Jesus on, on the street.
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some people were dropping money at her feet. So we thought next time we'll, t- we'll take a cap out and um, well, we'll have money soon for another pastor. <laughs> um, yeah, so we said to people, no, we don't want any money, but we put 150 in the offering box when we got back, didn't we? So it's worth more than £1.50. Um, but yeah, she did, did great. So thank you, Nicola, as well, um, for just for doing that. We had a flag saying Lighthouse Church. It's just good. So um, come out next time. So let me pray. Father, we, we thank you for your gift of salvation. We thank you for the gift of Jesus, Lord. You, your word tells us that we are all separated from you, God. E- even if we are good people in, in the world's eyes, God, we, we're separated from you because of that destructive nature of sin. But we thank you, God, that through repentance, through turning our lives to you, God, and asking for your forgiveness, you, you forgive us immediately, God. You restore us into relationship and you fill us with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray, God, for for our, our, our church, God, that we would be a church that really does look to the lost. God, that's why you plan, planted us here, God, to, to glorify you and to reach the lost, God. And as we reach the lost, we are, we are glorifying you and the work that Jesus has done. And we pray for all those seeds sown yesterday, God, that they would bear fruit in due season, that you, Holy Spirit, would water them and bring people into your kingdom. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.